Okay, I'm gonna uh, try to attempt to explain how a Python interpreter works in about 30 minutes. And I'll be doing that by showing you how to build like a really th the simple uh, the Python interpreter. In like technical terms, it's called a tree walk interpreter uh, from scratch in Python. But like the first thing that should come to your mind is why? Like why would you want to do that? Well, the, the, the point of this exercise is kind of twofold. Uh, the first point is that I want to show that that it's not some the, the crazy like, like black magic the wizardry to uh, create a programming language. It's kind of just like like writing any other piece of code. And the second point is that Python is like a 32 year old language. Like it has been contributed to by thousands of people. So I think that a lot of people would assume that like it would be too hard to contribute to. And yeah, like I wanted to show that at its core, the, like the Python interpreter is like, like uh, still fairly simple. And I think that you like still can, th that you should try to contribute to it. So yeah, so let's start the thing with a, like, like a bit of a story. A long time ago, I wanted to build a JSON parser. Yeah, uh, it would be something like this. Actually, give me one second. Can I stop, like, like uh, stop it from being uh, do some mirroring? I'd like it to be. Like you just a mirror what I see. Yeah, that's better. I think that's better. Yeah. Hmm. Should be good. Should be good. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, so, so I wanted to like, build a JSON parser, just like the one that's built into the standard library. I just like try to write something like that's a parse function. It uh, like, takes in a string, and then it uh, gives you whatever information that's available like inside the string, like directly available to you. Like uh, the fact that the that, uh, results had uh, like, uh, two objects like, inside it, which is the information of two people and that John here is a vegan, but Rob is not. And yeah, like uh, the thing is, uh, I'm sure that all of you have used a parse function like this, but like, like it's like often like I looked over that, like what is it like doing like exactly? So well, this like might look like a structured data to you, but to the computer, it's just a string of characters. And uh, yeah, so how do we make the computer understand the, the things like that uh, there are two keys here, and that the values are strings as opposed to like floats or numbers? Uh, how do we do that? Well, the first step of it is to uh, differentiate the, like, the different parts of the string that you have. Uh, like the fact that we have an opening and a, and a closing curly brace here, which are the, the colored in yellow. Uh, the, uh, like there's a red the colon the, the surrounded by these two strings in purple. This, the first level of, seg of se uh, like segregating the string input that we get is called the tokenizer. The step, of, the step after that comes from the JSON spec. And the spec is really important. But because the, like, without the spec, there would be like no definitive way to be able to figure out what exactly it means to be a JSON string. And uh, like thankfully, the json.org website has an exact the spec which defines like what it means to be a JSON object. Like it goes the, like something like this. In JSON, like an object is like defined as it's starting with a curly brace token. And then like there can be many items followed by a comma. And then it ends the, with another item with like no comma at the end. Like sadly, JSON doesn't have tailing commas. And then it closes with a closing curly brace. And what exactly are these items? The, like an item can be defined as a key and then a colon and a value. So for now, you can assume that the key and the values are strings in this, like in, this, in this example. And yeah, with that grammar properly defined, we are able to tell that, yeah, like that is supposed to be a JSON object. 
that these are like items, like th so there are two items in the object, and that's a key and a value. Yeah, so that's the pretty much all there is to parsing. Like once we have like the tokens, then we have a spec, we can take and structure the input, and we can th like, uh, like very easily extract the information out of it. Uh, yeah, I think like that's enough like uh, talking in the air. Let's actually look at some code. Yeah, so we uh, th like start with a tokenize function, which uh, takes in a JSON string and it uh, turns it into a queue of tokens. Uh, so what we do is fairly simple. We just uh, uh, start with the index zero, then so we keep going th th till the end of the string. We take out one character. Uh, first, so we check if it's any white space, then we just to jump over it by doing index plus equals one, then to continue on to the next character. Now, like if it's a character like, uh, like a curly brace or a bracket or something like that, we do the same, but we create this the token object and so we append it to, to our queue of tokens and then the, the we move on to the next character. There's like a, the more of the same, but uh, there's like a, the three things left here, which is a string, the, uh, like a number, and then everything else, which is the true, false, and null. That's the only the possible values that you can have in JSON. So for those, since we don't know how long that token is going to be, we just the pass in the current index to the function, and then the, we get the new index after the thing has been passed. Let's take a look at uh, the extract uh, string function for it. So like. The, the, what it does is actually pretty similar to uh, the top level tokenize function. So we start a while loop the, the, till the end of the string. But instead of the starting from zero, we start from the current index. Uh, and so we skip over like the starting quote, and we keep going until we see the end quote, at which point we go ahead of the quote, we like take the entire the quoted string out, the, 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 we append the token to our queue of tokens, and then the, we return the, the, like the index of the thing that we have, like after the string has been parsed. The only exception to this rule is when we see a backslash, in which case we jump over two tokens, and like uh, this allows you to, to escape things like uh, double quotes if you want to have that in your JSON string. And yeah, that's the pretty much like all there is to tokenizing. We just uh, the collect tokens like until the we run out of the JSON string, and then the we return the tokens that we have collected. Yeah, let's the look at the parse phase next. Uh, the parser will like uh, take out the first token from the token queue, and then like based on some the properties, to such as it being a square bracket, we call parse the so parse array. Like if it's a like an opening curly brace, so we call parse object. Like if it's a string or a number, we can just call that. And for true, false, and null, we just return the value true, false, or null. But like the the real magic that's happening here, like that's happening inside the parse the parse array and the parse object functions. So let's actually take a look at parse object. Uh, so to be able to like. To, parse, to be able to parse a JSON object, we start with an, the, like, the, with an empty dictionary. There is the one special case here, the, which is that if we see uh, like a closing curly brace immediately, we just return the empty object. But apart from that, we take a look at the first token. The, we expect it to be a key, so we like to parse it as a string. Then the, we expect to see a colon, token, which we just uh, the discard, and then for the value, we just call parse again. But hey, uh, the parse function is calling parse object, and now parse object is calling parse once again. How, like, how exactly like, is that like, supposed to work? Well, the thing is, uh, the parse function, so we saw that it, like, like it only looks at the tokens that it needs to look at. Like, like if we pass it the queue of tokens, that we'll take a look at the first one and say that it, th 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 if it happens to be a string, like it will just take that one token and then return. But the benefit from that is that we can just keep calling it. Uh, like this like, may be a bit hard to visualize, so let's actually try to see what's going on. 
So say that we call the top level pass function with these tokens. There's a that, then opening the curly brace, the string, colon, string, closing curly brace. Okay. The parse looks at the first token, like it happens to be an opening curly brace, so, uh, so it calls parse object. Uh, parse, the, the parse object, uh, th th like it expects the first token to be a key, and then it expects a colon, which it gets, and then it calls parse again for the value. And parse will like the look at the first token, and since, uh, like, like, is it an, like, like an opening bracket? No. Is it a curly brace? No. Like, like, is the type string? Yes. So we call parse string. Uh, from there, parse string, like, parses that token into a Python string. And then our parse object function expects like, either a comma or a closing curly brace. And since it like, finds a closing curly brace, we break out and we return that object. Yeah, since this technique uh, like, relies on recursion a lot, so where like, like, take parse, Tyke eventually ends up calling parse again, this technique it, like, is called recursive descent parsing. But yeah, uh, like with that implementation, our, like our JSON parser is effectively complete. Uh, let's actually try to, like this is how you would uh, like to, to use something like that. The, like by defining a tokenized function which can turn like the string into tokens and then like uh, calling parse over those tokens the, they, they, so we basically have a fully functional JSON parser now. Let's actually look at a demo of that. Yeah, so it's about the 300 lines of code, and uh, like if we try to the call the parse function with this JSON string. Yeah, the, 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 the we are effectively able to parse JSON, it works. And the, the good thing about JSON like, is that the spec is so simple, but JSON is like, the, so widely used that uh, like, even the, the something as complex like, as this, like, this API call that came from, I think, random user.me or something, this entire API call the, the should be parsable. Yeah, like, the, we have like a fully, the fully featured JSON parser from, I suppose, like a 300 lines of Python code. But yeah, that's not what the talk is about. The talk is about writing a Python interpreter. Uh, so yeah, like, like now we're gonna build like a Python the interpreter for this JSON parser like, like that we just wrote. So, so, so are we gonna build towards a package so called interpreted uh, which is a Python interpreter, and the Python interpreter is going to run the JSON parser. So yeah, let's try to do that. Okay, first things first, what, like, the, like, what exactly is like, what we call an interpreter? Well, like, that's actually three things. So the first part is the tokenizer. It like, turns your Python code into tokens. Like, tokens like, uh, like if you were to have a Hello World program, the tokens will be print, and then like an opening bracket, the string hello world, the, the closing bracket, and a new line. And the new line is important because Python doesn't have semicolons like, or anything like that. The only way for the parser to be able to tell like, that a statement has, has uh, finished is for there to be like, a token like a, like a new line. Then there's the parser phase, uh, which like, takes in these tokens, then it like, turns it into this like, nested data structure. And then there's the, the interpreter, which like runs this data structure from top to bottom, and then so we get our, our program execution. Yeah, the third phase is called the interpreter, even though it's part of the interpreter. I know. Yeah, let's look at the like the tokenizer first. Well, the the Python tokenizer is actually uh, like pretty much the same as the tokenizer that we wrote for the JSON module. Like there's just a few like a few additions. There's a, like two major changes. Uh, the first one is that that the new lines are important. Uh, and uh, like how exactly do we build that into like the Python or 
to, to, like tokenizer, we do something like this. Like, so, so say we have a method to scan one token. It like reads one character. Then if that character happens to be a new line, and uh, like we are not inside some like bracketed statement like a list or a multi-line statement, then the, we add a new line token. Like if we have any adjacent uh, new lines, those can just be ignored because uh, th like even though white space exists th in a code base, for the runtime, the white space like is the pretty much meaning the meaningless. And uh, the same holds true for like all the other white spaces that exists, those can also be skipped. And then the like like the tokenizer go, like, uh, goes on to, to like tokenize all the operators and variables and strings and brackets and everything, just like the JSON tokenizer. The second big change is that indentation matters in Python. Like, like as opposed to the pretty much every other language that uh, people write. Well, uh, to be, uh, to be able to support that, all we have to do is uh, the, whenever the, we add a new line token, we like, the, make sure to detect the indentation on that new line. Yeah, so let's uh, to see how we're going to do that. So the thing with indentation the, is that it's kind of like a stack because uh, the, if a line is indented by two levels, you need to know what the, both those levels are. Uh, because uh, like uh, things like this can happen. So, uh, like uh, say that uh, we start an if statement. There's the one level of indentation, say four spaces. Then uh, there's like a, like a bunch of empty lines. The comments are essentially empty lines for the runtime. Then we see uh, like another uh, the statement with like the, like the same level of indentation. So, so we need to be able to detect that that there has been no change like in the indentation. Then we go to two levels of indentation. Then now, the, 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 we have the, the indentation of eight spaces. When we go back, the, we need to be able to tell that 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 we have like, gone back to indentation level one. So, so to track that, the, we need a stack. And uh, similarly, like like right here, we have gone from the two levels of indentation to zero, and and that is uh, like really important to be able to tell. That, that we haven't gone from like, like here to here, we have gone completely outside. So to track that, like, we can do something like this. Uh, the, the, the we take out the, like, the, like the current level of indentation by the keeping looking at characters as long as like, like there are space or a tab, then so we add that to, to our level of indentation. Uh, the current indentation like, will be at the top of the stack and like if like there's a mismatch of the like the sequence of the uh, like, uh, like spaces and tabs in the indentation, we get this the classic error of inconsistent use of tabs and spaces. If uh, the current level of indentation is the same as like the indentation on the new line, we do nothing. But if the like if the new indentation is uh, the greater than the current level of indentation, so we add one indent token. And then, like the latest level of indentation has to be added to the stack. But if so we have a less number of uh, like, uh, like indent characters than the current indentation, then so we have to detect how many dedents we have to do. Say that uh, like the previous statement was uh, five indents in, and we have gone to the, like uh, two level of indents now. So the previous indent will match uh, like like index one because of uh, zero indexing. So we do a plus one to get to two. And that, then the, like the dedent count will be the, like, like the current length five minus two, that's three. So we, uh, like, so we add uh, three dedent tokens, then we take out those three indentations. Like, uh, so that's how we keep track of the current level of indentation. Yeah, on to the parser. The parser is actually pretty similar to the JSON parser. The only difference is that instead of making a dictionary, that they, that we make this nested Python object. Uh, hmm. One sec. Yeah, like that we take in a like a Python program, that we tokenize it, and then like we turn it into this like a structure. Like uh, for the hello world, that we know that like that there's a Python module, and inside 
like the body, there is like this thing called an expression statement, the, the, the which has a function call to the function print with the, the one argument, the, the, which is the constant hello world. This, the structure is called the parse tree for the abstract syntax tree. Well, the parsing bit is best explained live, so I'm just gonna to go through the code of the parser. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, so this is the the current grammar like of the parser that we're implementing. So like just like the like the like the JSON spec, we have a spec for Python as well. And yeah, like like at first glance, it's fairly straightforward. Like the what is a Python module? Like it's like just a like a bunch of statements. So a statement can be a single line statement or a multi line statement. So what's a multi line statement? That's a function definition, an if statement, a while loop, for loop, and so on. The function definition that well that starts with the def token, and then we see a name, and then we the, the, see an opening bracket, and then some like parameters if there are any. Then a closing bracket, the colon, and a block. We the, we'll the come to block in a second, but the parameters, like, the, like they'll just be a bunch of names, and like then we can have a comma and then a name and a comma and a name and so on forever, right? Well, uh, that's the pretty much how the parser thing is implemented in practice. We just take the grammar and like turn that into Python code. How? Well, the, when the parser starts, we simply call parse module. Let's try to go to the parse function. Yeah. So the like the parse function will the, the create a list of statements, and then like we just uh, like uh, keep going until the whole like uh, module has been parsed. Then we call parse statement. So we get back one statement. Then so we append that to the list of statements that we parsed. Then we return a module. That is basically what that's saying. For a statement, let's look at parse statement. Parse statement is just like either we call parse multi-line statement or parse single line statement. Yeah, uh, parse multi-line statement will take eventually go on to call parse block. Like let's take a look at parsing an if statement. So the, the, like for the if statement, we call parse expression. So we expect like a colon after it, and then we call parse block. And parse block is kind of interesting. Let's look at the grammar of it. Uh, well, like a block is defined as a new line, then indent, like a bunch of statements, then then a dent. And yeah, like like that makes sense. Like 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 that's a block of code. Like it happens to be on a new line. There's like a new level of indentation. We have some statements, and then so we dent back. So yeah, uh, yeah where's that? Yeah, uh, the thing with blocks is uh, they, we can implement it something like this. So parse block will expect a new line, then an indent, like it will they can make a body for that block. And uh, like as long as it's not like a fully parse or we see a dent, we keep calling parse the statement and append those. But parse statement, can call parse multi-line statement, and multi-line statements have blocks inside them. So, like, what's going on there? Well, uh, take, let's try to like try to visualize that as well. So, so, we have a function here, then we find a block, and like, like, to say that's the block that we are currently parsing. Uh, we'll take find a one level of indent, and then we find a first statement, which happens to be. So it's a multi-line statement. So like that's a while loop. The while loop itself like uh, goes on to call parse block. Like so we find a new line. So, so we find the one indent. Then then we like uh, so go on to parse the statements. Like like that's a single line statement. That's a single line statement. And then so we find one more multi-line statement. So, so so we call parse block again. So we find a new line and like like one indent, uh, the, the single line statement. And then finally we find one dent. Like at that point, the the parse block in yellow will return, and then immediately after that, this like like third statement in the green block has 
the finally finished parsing, and then the green parse block will find a dead end and then return. Then, like then, the, for the blue one, like it has finally parsed its first statement, which is the while statement. Then it will parse the second statement, and then the like, like file that yeah the file has ended. Like let's return. So that's how the parsing phase goes. Yeah, from there we can move on to the interpreter. And uh, yeah, how does code run? Like that's the question. Say we have a parse tree, like the one that we saw. How do we make it run? Well, the thing is, uh, like, like just how the, you might have been taught how Python programs run. They run top to bottom, left to right. Like, it actually is that simple. That, like a Python module is a bunch of statements. Like how do you run those statements? One by one, top to bottom. Say that, like that's the program. The, the problem comes from the deeply nested sort of the, the recursive nature like of the AST. Uh, the problem here is that we have a module, but inside the body, there can be like any kind of node, really. And inside that node, there can be any kind of node. So how do you deal with that? Like, like, how, many, like how many if statements would you like to write? Not many, I hope. But yeah, uh, like, like to deal with that, like there's this thing called the visitor pattern. Like, like uh, that's what will help us do the entire like uh, interpretation thing. So yeah, let's actually should take a look at the interpreter. Interpreter, yeah, yeah. So, so we have an interpreter class, and like it happens to have a global scope. The like the scopes are the scopes are really important. So we have a bunch of so built-in functions that exist in the global scope, and then we set like, like the current scope, which happens to currently be the global scope as well. And then the, 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 the we have the top level visit method. Now the visit is what will be called with the module. And then the visit is supposed to interpret the entire parsed tree. So well, the, like what we do is fairly simple. We look at the kind of the node it is. Like right now this will return module. And uh, we try to look th th for a function with the same name. So we try to look for the visit module. And then th we just like run that. And take what is the visit module doing? Well, it uh, go like, goes over all the statements in the body, and it just calls self.visit statement. The notice is the use of self.visit. Like uh, this is like the thing that's uh, very interesting about the visitor pattern is that like we can just keep so we're visiting the children in the sequence that we want them to be run. So you can kind of think of cell dot to visit as just self dot run. So we just run that statement. Then how does that get run? Well, take uh, say that it happens to be uh, a print statement. So it will be a function call. So this will be call. Then take it will uh, look for a visit call and visit call will be called with that node. Yeah. Uh, let's actually go through a simple example of this. I think that would be better. Yeah. Uh, say that we are doing something like this. Uh, Python dash m interpreted dot parser. Yeah. Let's do x equals 2. Uh, no. Let's do x equals 2 plus 2. Print, print x. Yeah, so that's what the parse tree of that looks like. And if you want to make it a bit more like a tree, we can just run black on it. So yeah, that's the transformed code. And yeah, the module, like a body, has an assign node, which uh, th th that's the first statement. And the second statement is called an, like it's called an expert statement because the thing inside it like is an expression. Now function calls can like uh, return values, but since we don't care about the value in this case, we just uh, like say that hey, like treat this expression as a statement. Don't like like don't worry about the return value. So let's like try to walk through this. So like the when we visit the like the first statement, we'll go through visit assign. 
and the, the like a visitor sign will uh, try to visit the value and the, like what's the value the value is a binary operation it's like a, like a doing a binary operation to between the constant 2 and the constant 2 then like the operation there is plus so let's try to look at visit bin op yeah so we get that we run like take the left and the right side of the binary operation by just calling cell dot visit and since these happen to be constants let's look at visit constant yeah that just uh, takes the value out which is 2 it like, like wraps it in a value object and then just like returns that so if we go back up to bin op yeah so we get a value object with the value 2 and a value object with the value 2 now we just uh, like uh, define all the, the operations to, to, since the operator is plus to have we return a new value with the value 2 plus 2 which is 4 now we have to go back take up to visit a sign like we have only visited the the value part of it yeah so this gives us a value object with the value 4 and uh, for like the, the, the for names so doing an assignment is a, a fairly simple and like so we happen to be assigning it to a name x so, so in that case we just set the value to the name in the current scope yeah fairly simple for like like trying to assign to like a dictionary key or to a list index it gets much more complicated but we're not doing that so i'm not gonna worry about that but yeah like now we have set the value 4 to the name x in the current scope so what happens next uh, well like the next thing is a call to the name print with one argument which is the name x yeah so we do a visit expert statement and yeah like that's gonna be fairly the fairly anticlimactic we just the visit the expression inside then we don't return the value so we return none okay let's look at visit call then so we are visiting a call the call is to the function print and uh, the the name print and visit name so what does that do so we take the name out we check like if it's in the like the like the current scope like if it is not set in the current scope so we try to look for it in the global scope like and if that's not set we just like so we say that like that the name has not been defined but in our case like, like both the scopes happen to be the same to be the same and uh, we have defined i believe uh, cell dot globals yeah so like we have like a defined print to be the print function so what do we do when we actually find it uh, where were we visit call yeah we found the function so like which happens to be an object that we that we created called print since it is a take of the type function we uh, collect all the arguments by visiting every single arg like like now the argument is also a name so it will be taken out of the like from the current scope and if it's not there like, like it, that will be found in like in the global scope so we take out the value x from the scope which is 4 and uh, that so becomes the value for in these arguments and then we take this uh, function object and we call it with, uh, with the arguments so let's try to look at the the print function when we call it we just uh, convert all the arguments to strings and we print it so yeah uh, that's how this the program should run so if i were to so move it out of the parsing phase and just run it oh yeah the pretty part is not there so yeah that should print four so yeah now one like the like a glaring thing that's still left to be discussed is like what about functions like like sure like like there's the global scope but what about function scopes and the, the, the things like that 
while interpreting functions is also like it's not very tricky. So we have this thing co here called a user defined function or a user function. Well, when the, whenever we see a function definition, we just like a, the create a user function with the definition, which is uh, like like the body, all the statements and everything. We wrap that inside this the user function object, and like we just uh, store that in the current scope. So like you could define the function at the global scope or inside a local scope or something like that. And when we run this function, and so we get a user function the object from the scope, when we call it, we are calling this part. User function. Yeah, when we do a call, the call we do is uh, we store like the current, the scope of the interpreter. We create a new scope for the function. We set that to be the entire interpreter scope so, so for a bit. Then so for every single like argument that was uh, passed to the function call, we take out uh, like, like these arguments, the values. We take the function parameters from the function definition that we stored when the user function object was created. And uh, like in that like new scope, we assign like these arguments to the, to the parameters. And then so for every single statement that was defined in the function, we visit those statements. Like if we encounter a return statement somewhere in there, we catch that as an exception and we, like we just return that as the value of that function call. And then finally, we set the scope of the interpreter back to the parent scope when the function exits. So yeah, uh, with this, we should have a working interpreter. So yeah, like with suppose like around uh, like this like takes uh, like implementing a visit function to for every single type of the node that you have in your parser. But the implementation of like most of them is, is the fairly simple. Like for break and continue, we just uh, like to do uh, to take an exception. My favorite. The cover is a visit pass where we just pass, but yeah, with like around six, seven hundred thick lines of interpreter code, we should be able to run this code inside our interpreter. And yeah, it works. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. But the one thing that maybe a few of you take might have in your mind is that, wait, that's a toy implementation that doesn't really do like anything. Like where's my favorite th the, 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 Python the Python feature in this implementation? Like, they, like there's a bunch of things that we haven't even talked about. Like, gen like, like, like the bytecode that's get to gen that gets generated in the actual implementation. Things like uh, the classes are not implemented. Threads and IO, th 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 like I haven't even, th th so, like, looked at that code to be honest. But the thing is, most of these can be implemented, uh, like, the fairly simply. The current the framework that you have with this tokenizer parser and, like, then interpreter, this can be expanded upon to like, add all of these one by one. And, the, like, you know the best part? Like, all these, like, there's all these. Uh, like other libraries that are like to return to purely in Python. Like AsyncIO, so for example, is like a giant the blob of Python. It's like 15,000 lines of code. And you don't have to re-implement that to be able to re-implement Python. It's just like it's Python code. You can run it. And like the, like the same holds true for all of these like the, the separate take libraries as well. Like C Python as a whole is, I think, a uh, one-third C code and a two-thirds Python code. But yeah, that's the basically everything I have. Uh, like if you like want to look at some resources, like the interpreter that I have created, the, like the implementation th has 
take a large amount of influence from the book uh, Crafting Interpreters. And if you want to, to learn about the exact internals of C Python, there's like a book by Anthony Shaw. It's called uh, C Python Internals. It's like a really good book. But yeah, thanks for your time. So we have around like four minutes for uh, questions. So if anyone has any questions, please sign up. Yeah, hi. Uh, when you were talking about parsing blocks, uh, you said that the parser looks for the dent and then sort of returns. Yeah. Does that mean that if you add a bunch of empty lines with just indentation, for example, hmm. would that make the parser actually take a bit longer to parse? Uh, well, the parser won't, but the tokenizer will. So, like at the tokenization phase, we like essentially ignore, take all your, like a duplicate uh, the, the new lines that we see. So, if like there's like just a bunch of white space that will just be looked over by the tokenizer, and there'll be only one the, like the new line token to look at. So, yeah, like not like not really, but sort of. Okay, so this may be an unfair question, but taken to the natural conclusion, uh, are there any benefits to writing your Python interpreter? And for that I mean, can you maybe implement a specialized subset of Python that is optimized for memory, optimized for performance, something along these lines? So, yeah, most definitely. And like, if you look, to look at the implementations of like the, the stackless Python or like my, so MicroPython, that's exactly what they've done. They have like, taken the Python interpreter and uh, specialized it to, to the use case that they want. So yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, hi. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but I've been doing some work recently with Lark that I think is a Python library that lets you write custom grammars and parsers. I was curious if you've used anything like that and what the trade-offs might be for using something like that versus doing it from scratch like you've done in the talk? So I'm sorry, the, like, what does the tool do? It adds the custom take a grammars to what, to um, Python? It, it lets you, you can basically define your own grammar and then it will give you a parser for that grammar so you could write your own language with so, it quite quickly. So, yeah, so like if, like if you were to take, take write a, like a non-toy implementation of something like this, you should probably like use these things called parser, the parser generators. Now, I didn't use them because I wanted to do the entire talk in 30 minutes, but like like there are th like a bunch of these uh, things that can like take in your grammar th and give you a parser out of it. But uh, yeah, like there are also th th like huge languages like the Ruby, for example, for the longest time had a handwritten parser. And like, I don't think that Ruby is a toy language. But yeah, like, like, both, the, like both the approaches, they exist. The, like, they have their own the trade-offs. But yeah, like, like, both are valid ways to do the same thing. All right. Cool. Uh, great. Thank you so much, uh, Tushar, for the talk. Uh, so we're going to have the keynote ha happening here next really soon. So stick around for that. <laughs>